All right, it is uh, my, uh, my pleasure to introduce um, our brand new uh, distinguished fellow, the Macro Finance uh, Society, Per Courcel. Um, per is uh, a um, uh, Rag uh, Thorsten and Ragnar Soderberg Chair in Economics at the Institute of Economic Studies in Stockholm University, as well as Centennial Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. Uh, of course, in this uh, group, Per really does not uh, need much of an introduction. Uh, he has done wide-ranging work in the macroeconomics. Perhaps what's best known to um, the members of this society is his work uh, or with Tony, Tony Smith on um, the role of income and wealth heterogeneity in uh, macro. That has had a lot of impact on uh, not just you know macro, but also asset pricing and this nexus of macro finance where we talk about heterogeneity and role of heterogeneity and wealth distribution that we already talked about uh, today. And also, of course, the, the methodology of working with models where wealth distribution uh, is, is a state variable and, and, and is quite uh, uh, tricky for um, large economies with large numbers of agents and aggregate and idiosyncratic shocks. We, of course, uh, saw uh, this a little bit in uh, yesterday's session with the Re Real Cycles paper. Uh, but you know, many members of the society work in this uh, in this area, either on the um, uh, household side or production side, or or, or both. Uh, uh, Pear has also, of course, had a very influential work on the role of uh, investment-specific technological change uh, in macro, uh, as well as kind of capital skill complementarity things that are now you kind know, of at the forefront of uh, people's uh, attention as we try to understand the role of. Um, uh, skill, uh, skill bias, technological change, and driving both kind of macro aggregate quantities and uh, and heterogeneity and equality and so on and so forth, um, and of course, uh, again, a wide variety of uh, other uh, kind of areas of intersection of macro and and labor and macro and uh, and finance, monetary policy, uh, growth, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to take away any more of uh, Pear's time. I will uh, stop my uh, my share and let uh, Per share his slides and uh, um, tell us what he is inter kind of is is interested in uh, these days. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a, of course a real honor and and uh, I'm not gonna do a long intro here uh, other than to say that my first the first published work that I have with Tony on uh, you know, um, aggregate shocks and wealth inequality and so on is, is, is an asset pricing ap application that appeared in 97 before our paper in 98 was published. Uh, and we barely presented it. We presented it once and the leading uh, finance person, I'm not going to name the name of the person, absolutely slaughtered it. And so we we were asked to put it in some, I mean, like in a volume, we put it in a volume and we, <laughs> uh, so, so that's, that was the beginning of, the, of that journey. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy to be here or uh, I mean, quote unquote at Wharton. And uh, um, I, I guess um, I, I want to um, go over kind of a broad, um, set of things in a way, but it is about macroeconomic dynamics. And actually that paper that was slaughtered by a finance person was published. Uh, I think it was macroeconomic dynamics. I may, I may get this wrong now, but it was that or JADC. But anyway, um, and, and so we worked on that wealth heterogeneity, but now, I mean, I have a big interest in household finance because of all of this. So that, I think the, the, if I have a message, um, the message is now that at least I'm super interested in household finance and, and its intersections with macro. Um, but I will start in a kind of a broad, in a broad way and explain to you why I think this is interesting uh, kind of for macro. But so uh, first of all, I think I am happier if you interrupt me and ask questions during the talk than, than taking it afterwards. Um, so that's my um, my preference. Okay, so here's a, 
I'll make the I make the slides available uh, afterwards. I'm going to run through it quickly, but like an extremely brief history of modern macro is um, there was, as you know, a frustration when I was a graduate student with Keynesian economics on methodological grounds. You know, Lucas critique, unstable relationships, hard to conduct welfare analysis, and then my advisor Neil Wallace, together with Lucas and Sargent and a bunch of people. Tried, started a new on uh, the microeconomic foundations path that I think we are still on, but for a long time, um, these models were very simple, very stylized. They were, they were not in particular quantitatively serious, I would say. Um, the econometric evaluation was very spotty. Um, it often involved, except in Lucas's very first paper, uh, markets that work wonderfully well and everybody was super rational and everything. Uh, in particular also, they had, Macro had, had this representative agent assumption that's been kind of with us for a long time. And I think that among all the assumptions that has been a, one of the toughest ones to improve on. But um, I and many other people have worked on trying to you know, push heterogeneous agent macro forward as the main as a main path to build on uh, for future work. And heterogeneous agent macro is potentially very useful in many ways. I mean, for business cycles, monetary economics, you all know the acronym HANK by now, which uh, you know isn't mine, but um, that, that's marrying New Keynesian with heterogeneous agents. Um, and the idea here is to deliver you know, a framework with uh, higher propensities to consume on average. I mean, the, it's not, not maybe not been so obvious for outsiders, but the standard macro models has very low propensities, to, marginal propensities to consume. So if the government gives people money, they spend only a small fraction of the money they receive. So that makes demand-oriented policy uh, not very potent. Okay, uh, but so th th this uh, heterogeneous agent framework can can break out of this at least potentially. Um, and so now the, it also has uh, very rich implications for also for inequality. And many people are interested in inequality these days, including central banks um, who are interested in it from a number of perspectives. However, um, I would say straightforward heterogeneous agent models. And I'll be more specific. Um, they are like representative agent models where you add insurable idiosyncratic wage risk uh, they robustly don't do well. In particular, they predict very limited wealth inequality, and we see enormous wealth inequality in all societies. Uh, they predict actually very low MPCs on average, so it's not really allowing us to break out of that low MPC uh, paradigm. And the MPC dispersion among households is also not very big. So, of course, when people have come across this, they have come up with various tricks uh, to get out of it. And of course, tricks work because that's what they are, tricks. Um, and, but they are just tricks. Uh, so I'll get back to that. So, so what I, I want to propose now um, is an extension of the framework, general framework where the key feature is heterogeneity in the return that households receive on their saving. Standard model doesn't have this. The standard model has like a household that saves at the safe return, or it could be could be risky return, but it's like everybody's facing the same return process. So this you could view as a trick. And in fact, some people have used it as a trick, but the, the perspective I take here uh, is based on work I've done and others. Uh, which is to actually look at individual data. And in the individual data, it becomes incredibly clear how this assumption is much more reasonable than the assumption that everybody has the same return. So it, I have a paper with Joachim Homer and Tony Smith. And by the way, you know that work I draw on heavily here, also on some recent work I'm doing with a former student who's now at Glasgow, Richard Fulton. But anyway, in that NBR macro annual paper, we document this and it's coming from, I'll give you all the proper references. Um, 
and, and, and we incorporated, I think, in a very successful way. However, so we kind of we we came up with a framework that we think is very nice. Um, however, it hardwires um, doesn't explain the for portfolio return heterogeneity. We put in per portfolio return heterogeneity that is reasonable on a micro level, but we hardwire it, and you'll see how. The thing is, when you do, you get a very good account of U.S. wealth inequality, both on average and its evolution over time. You get much more kind of reasonable MPCs. Um, they're higher, they are more dispersed. <clears throat> but now I think, and this is a little bit like getting quickly to the message. Um, for me, the challenge now is once I understood this, that this is key, uh, I also want to understand why people don't diversify. Why is there such diversity of returns for observably uh, equivalent people somehow. Um, and in particular, there's also strong um, uh, strong regularity in that the richer you are, the higher your return is on average. There's more of fact, but so we need to explain these things now, I think. I mean, before you might have considered them um, interesting intellectually. For me now, they've become crucial. Why? Because I think they, they form the core of understanding macro with heterogeneous agents. Okay, so I think now there's an incredibly important connection between macro and finance, I mean, in particular household finance, because I'm talking mostly here about households, um, which is not to say there are no other good connections between macro and finance. Uh, so just to set the stage, let me introduce this kind of simplest, stupidest model of MPCs. Um, I do that because this is the core that people have uh, in their representative agent models. And because straightforward heterogeneous agent models are not that far from this, this is still relevant. So here's a dynasty saving, okay? And the saving is occurring at the rate R minus delta, that's constant, there's a constant wage. I'm gonna assume we're in a steady state, that's reasonable because we're describing like balanced growth type features. Uh, and, and this gives, it's deterministic. It gives a, a saving and consumption rule that you all are very familiar with. Consumption is just the return on the money you have in the bank plus the flow income, which is constant over time. You maintain the same level in the bank as you started the period with, okay? But what I want to focus on here is that if I give somebody money, if I increase K0, how much does C go up? <laughs> By that amount times R minus delta. And R minus delta is super small. So quantitatively, I mean, the permanent income model, nice model, but it gives super small R, uh, emphases. So what, what do, I mean, if this were borne out by looking at data, that, that would be fine. But the way, I mean, of course, it's very difficult to identify this in the data, but I'm going to uh, just draw on Christina Patterson's paper that goes over, including her own paper. This is just showing in a bunch of papers that try as well as they can to identify emphases. The average emphases people find are not R minus delta, they are like 40%. I mean, you see, it's not like any of them are down even at 0.3, they're all like very high, okay? Uh, this second graph is showing the dispersion of MPCs also. So the x-axis has MPCs and the, the it's a histogram with each bar representing, I don't know, a different type of group. Um, so you see enormous dispersion and on average, it's very high. So now I think one would like, I mean, I think there's a lot to these estimates and we should produce models that, that are consistent uh, or more consistent with this data. So heterogeneous agent models, the standard one that everybody uses, I, you can call it Hagitai Agari Imro Horoglu because Aisha Imro Horoglu wrote the very first paper that was like a complete paper. It wasn't general equilibrium, but she has the, the key things going, so I should, should include that uh, here. But anyway, this is a rep agent model like the one you just saw with idiosyncratic partial insurance shocks to, to the W. So W is no longer constant. 
This, because you can save, but you can't fully insure, gives rise to typically unique long-run wealth distribution that looks, I mean, kind of like in the data, uh, qualitatively. You get MPC heterogeneity because people who have been unlucky, they are worriers more, they're in need and, and they have higher MPCs. Uh, so it's typically people with low income realizations, low liquid wealth, okay? So that's kind of the core. Um, let, so what, I, yeah? Let me pause you before you get more into, into this since we have a question for, from- Yeah, I don't, I'm not looking at questions that would, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, I, will, I will interrupt you when the questions come in as-, as Yeah. All right, Stavros, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I just like, uh, I'm taking you up on your offer to have the questions during the talk. Uh, what um, the more conventional way of trying to get the MPC up, and I was just like surprised you haven't talked about this, is to assume borrowing constraints. So could you comment on why you're not talking about borrowing constraints? I I meant to I meant to include that there are clearly borrowing constraints here in this basic framework. If if there's no borrowing constraint, then uh, I mean I. It depends a bit on how you set up, but boring constraint is a crucial feature of all these models. So I, I just forgot to write it down. It, it's incomplete markets with boring constraints. Um, so so I'll, what I'll do kind of first here is show you that you can do very well on wealth inequality and get a much richer MPC distribution with the same type of model if you add uh, return heterogeneity that I mentioned before. And, and if you, in particular, hardwire it, that's what we did. And we did that for a reason. Uh, and, and the reason is in the third bullet here. Like we, we couldn't find a way of not hardwiring it. I, I mean, my understanding of household finance that I will talk about much more later in the talk is that it, it doesn't have an easy time getting the, back, the, the basic facts right. Um, so I'll, I'll document a little bit that in this talk that they, it's not like there's some off the shelf thing that works that you can just import, which is why I'm interested in working on this now. Uh, and then at the end, I'll show you like a desperate way forward. Um, uh, and what's looming large here, of course, is that there may just be a bunch of behavioral things explained in the data. Uh, but kind of before going there, let's explore return it unit. I'm sure you all have all seen that Calvea, Campbell, Sodini, and um, uh, Gomez are, they have a recent uh, paper that's been around for, but they're presenting now again that, that does kind of this to, to make sense of the data. So I'm going to show you something that's similar uh, or in spirit at least and see if that kind of can work. So, so now what I'll do is just give you like a quick recap of this macro annual paper and, and and not because, I, I mean, I don't believe in presenting stuff that's already out there, but the point here is to kind of emphasize the features that I want to move forward with. So this is just a recap of top wealth inequality in the US. You know, the, the, this is a top 1% share of wealth that is like uh, 30%, but in particular since 1970, uh, different measures. Let's not get into exactly the difference between them, but they're different measures. They all have a bit similar features, they fall uh, and they reach a minimum in the 70s and then they go up and, and you know, it's argued how much they, they go up and it depends on the particular measure. This, this is the fraction of the top 0.1%. Uh, so let's see if we can make sense of this data, not only on average, so kind of explaining that on average, the top 1% owns almost a third of wealth. But let's see if we can also make sense of the time path of it. So the way we're gonna do this is just take the Ayagori 94 QJ paper. We model labor income, uh, you know, not in the fanciest possible way, but we restrict it to microdata. Uh, PSID plus we add a Pareto tail in labor income because there is a Pareto tail uh, quite clearly at the top. So we tack that on. We also have unemployment as a, you know, exogenous state and try to calibrate that. Um, but then we add heterogeneous returns and I'll explain exactly what 
what that looks like, um, that, that have the feature that uh, returns are increasing in your wealth, um, but that there is also an idiosyncratic return component. We make it IID here, okay, and there's like disagreements on whether it is or it isn't, but let's keep it IID. Then we add a bunch of other things like progressive taxation. The reason we do that, it's been changing over the time of this time period. So actually, potentially, you know, these swings here have something to do with the environment changing. And the environment has changed both in terms of the wage inequality that we feed in, also taxation. So in particular, if you look again at the graph, when Reagan came around, there were there were huge changes to the to the tax code, right? So that could affect things. Um, we also have a safety net. We, we, we don't model the details of the poorest households here, but we, we have a sort of a rough way of capturing that. So time varying tax system, labor income process that is calibrated to data. Um, and then we, we feed in this these returns that people face and we restrict them to match some data and I'll talk about it. Um, so really in our model, the only decision people make that we don't have labor supply choice, it's just a saving decision. Why? Because portfolio choice, we don't allow. We just hardwire, if you save this much, this is your return process that you get, okay? So we did that because we felt, okay, that's what it looks like in the data to explain it really hard. So let's just feed it in. You do choose your saving rate. It turns out that the choice of the saving rate is very kind of robustly depending on pretty much nothing. Uh, I mean, of course, it depends on the discount factor and so on, but it's not like varying a huge amount. Um, we tried the model with uh, perfect foresight and compared it to being very myopic. The saving rate barely changed. So actually the choice in here, the model is fairly mechanical because the choice is just about this one thing that turns out to be very, very stable. Um, okay, now let me talk about what's important for, for this audience, I hope, which is the return on asset holding. So if you have assets A, if you're rich, you have a high value for A. This is your return. So this is a base return. Then there is an expected component that just increases, it's gonna be increasing, but in general could be anything in your the level of your wealth. And then the level of your wealth also determines the, uh, this, the noise size. This is a sigma. And this is uh, just an IED standard normal. So your asset level is important both for the average and for the noise component. And we're gonna take them from data and I'll tell you how. Um, and we just, this is just, uh, I don't know, it's fed in, it's what people get when they save A. They can't do anything about it, all right? So I'll, this is the consumer's problem. And as you can see, they're only choosing A, T plus one. There's no other choice. Uh, utility function cash on hand minus cash tomorrow. Um, I should have deleted this. Beta T is that we allow the discount factor to be random, but it, in in the results I'll show you, it's not random and it doesn't play any role. I, I mean, maybe it's good that you see it here because if if you read my paper with Tony from like ninety eight, uh, then you know that probably that we use random discount factors. That is one of the tricks in the literature to generate a lot of wealth inequality. Well, it turns out we, try, we put it in here just to see how big that heterogeneity had to be to match the data. Turns out we precisely setting it co to constant works very well. Um, so, so actually in all the results, it is a constant, okay? And then you see the return process showing up here ordinary income, capital gains, uh, you have tax rates and stuff here. Persistent compounding of earnings, that's that's a state variable, and cash on hand is a state variable. Okay? There, I think. I, yes, I, I imagine I might have a question, yes. Hannah, you wanna just ask it rather than me reading your okay. question? Uh, sure, Per, question about the, this setup. So do agents inside this model understand how their savings choice affects this return schedule. So do they take that into account when they make asset accumulation decisions that they can change 
Um, they do. They do. Oh, they do. So they take that into account. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is all. This is all. As you can see here, this is all. Is rational expect E here means rational expectations, and you see exactly what this stuff does to you. Yeah. And, Got it. And okay. just just to fold, there's no aggregate risk as far as I could tell so far. Well, right? so here you don't see any. No. So actually, when we're going to address the the trend in the data, either with completely myopic about what's happening in the aggregate or perfect foresight path. Okay. We, we don't have aggregate uncertainty here. We don't need it for the questions we're asking. So we just, that's what we did. Um, so, so let me just tell you just uh, a little bit about wealth inequality. Now, what happens when you mod, try to model wealth inequality? The very first thing you do when you uh, <laughs> teach first year macro is you take complete markets. Well, you'll know that with complete markets, the long run wealth inequality is kind of equal to the initial wealth inequality you feed in. It's like conditional that everybody makes decisions and, and maintain their wealth. So it's a permanent income thing. So you keep your initial wealth. So the long run inequality is the same as the one you started with. It's an inadequate model, I would say, uh, because I know, we have some very robust stylized facts. And it's, I don't think the solution of the interpretation of, of the data is, is correct to say that, well, it's all because that's the way it started. Okay, I think rather something is happening, making it look the way it looks. So what is the model of that? Well, you have incomplete markets. It has short predictions for long run stuff, independent of initial conditions. So you get unique wealth distributions typically. I mean, there people have maybe found an exception to this, but this is very robust. Uh, the problem is too little wealth inequality. The, the genie of wealth in particular looks like the genie of earnings. And the genie of earnings is much smaller in the data than the genie of wealth. So this is the problem. And, and then here are the tricks. Well, preference heterogeneity, that's our trick in the middle here, like we stick in beta shocks. Um, and we did it in a structured way, but there's no way we can connect it to anything observable. You can assume that people are not dynasties, they're finite lives. And if you pick particular bequest functions, uh, that can help. But again, it's not like those bequest functions are calibrated from anything. It's just tricks that work. There's another trick that works, which is assume that once you get like to the very highest earnings level, the risk of falling all the way down to zero is like huge. Uh, so it's like everybody is, who is uh, the Tiger Woods, or I don't know what the best example is today, but they, they run the risk of just dropping all the way down, becoming, becoming unemployed for a long period of time. And this works because it creates a lot of precautionary saving for the very richest. They care a lot about risk because they know they might fall all the way down. It doesn't make any sense to me. So these are tricks. They work to get, get wide distribution, but it's like not a way forward. So I, I think, so what, what I like about this that we kind of stumbled upon is that we feed in micro observations. Uh, we tie our hands completely. It's not that we've introduced a new structural parameter and allow it to be anything or hand wave about. We, we, we put in this return process and we, what do we do with it? We, uh, well, so here's our return process. Um, we just say, okay, the expected part uh, is the portfolio share uh, that people in asset group A on average have. Uh, and then we have these four group, four types of assets. So it's risk-free or like cash, public equities, I mean, traded stock, private equity, uh, and then housing. Uh, so, and we kind of look at the shares and, and that's where we get the returns uh, with the respective returns for each category, which, which we take from data. And then what about the standard deviation? Well, again, we look at this, the standard deviations in the, in the data and we see that in here with, with of course, the appropriate portfolio weights. Uh, so, and we could have used the Norwegian admin, administrative data. We could have used uh, other things. We used the Swedish one because it was close and we 
talked a lot to Paolo Sedini uh, about it. Uh, so we get to understand the data well. Um, and this is how it looks. I mean, one version of it. Uh, I guess their paper is published now, eventually 2020 in AR. Um, so you see the blue stuff here is real estate and, and real estate is big in the, in the middle of the, these are percentiles uh, in the middle. Uh, cash, huge, uh, and then falling. Uh, dark green, risky financial wealth, uh, which includes stock market. There are a few other categories, um, but private equity is, is, is enormous at the top. That's the brown. Okay, there's something about leverage. So you see the very systematic facts here of, on how portfolios differ in wealth. Here is how returns differ. Let's look at the blue first. The blue uh, is the mean excess return. So excess over and above the like, risk less. Uh, so it, it's increasing in wealth um, and in the, or in the percentile in this case. Uh, and you see that it's, uh, it's almost 10 percentage points here and like one and a half down here. Big, big difference. You know, this matters when you accumulate for a given rate of saving, it matters, okay? The other thing, uh, here's the idiosyncratic component, standard deviation. Um, first of all, it's big, but not only that, it's really, really big at the top. So of course you might wonder like, what is this exactly? And I don't have all the answers, but I can see that uh, an expert raised a hand I mean, you're all experts, but... Francisco, go ahead. Thank you. My microphone was not working. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, I was just saying, if you look at that distribution, I mean, I see you know, a difference sort of in the lower end of the distribution as, as we'd expect a lot of those people don't participate in the stock market. But you know, the graph, I mean, the way the graph is done, I mean, it's very important if we want to focus on the right tail of the distribution, we want to understand why the super rich are really different from the other. If you look at a scale, I mean, you go all the way until P99 and it's basically the same as P60, right? I mean, you have all those bars are essentially the same. It's really like when you start narrowing in on like the really, really top. So could we say that if we, we don't care about the Bill Gates and those guys of the world. We don't need to worry too much about that. We need to worry about the guys who don't participate and things like that. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, you could do that. Th then I would say mostly um, that, yeah, you're right. Uh, um, this paper that we wrote was actually a little bit more about the, the, the extreme right tail so we we were interested in that so i'm taking the pictures from the published paper so but you, you're absolutely right but the key is there there's a lot of idiosyncrasy uh okay. across the board so that, that that's really the main takeaway i just wanted to show you like this is the data 10 years ago one of my colleagues in development economics said well but of course people who are richer make more money um on average and blah 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 and then i said well that I don't believe that. Why would that be true? I read the Finance 101, and I guess maybe I hadn't read the most updated Finance 101, but it took for me it took looking at the data that these guys have to to feel like I can't look away. I have to take this into account. And that, um, but but it's true. Like what you what you said is is um, yeah. Depending on your focus, you we may or may not care about the the, the extreme right tail. So anyway, we stick this in and, and we have a target of a steady state uh, wealth inequality, just data model. And all I wanna sh show here is that there is a bunch of, there's a bunch of numbers here, but the data and the model are incredibly close without discount factor heterogeneity. And we're just feeding this in. It's, it, here there is no trick and that's the main point. Th there are questions, Stavros and maybe someone else too. Per, just uh, one quick clarifying question. Maybe it echoes uh, to some extent what Francisco asked you. It feels that when you when we try to explain inequality, there is kind of two inequality, two two things that are, seem very important to explain the tails. 
I think that's hopeless without heterogeneity at returns. And you're absolutely right there. It's, I think like anybody who has tried to calibrate this model knows that. But if one tries to explain everything below the 1%, the top 1%, so like normal people, let's put it this way, it feels for that, like I want to just comment on something you said that you kind of need a... Um, there it feels that whether you use a representative agent or an OLG framework does make a difference because the life cycle produces, even in a model where everybody earns the same income, just the fact that they start with zero wages and slowly, slowly they accumulate wealth to finance their retirement, that by itself will create wealth inequality between the younger and the older agents. I think Mankiw, maybe I'm misquoting him, but I, I vaguely remember a quote of the sort that everybody's going to make it to the top 1% at some point in their life. So there is a lot of inequality just over the life cycle. And it yeah, feels but that I, I, let, me, let me shut that down a little bit in the sense that I, I, I of course, Part of me agrees with that, but but there are Mark Calgett did a bunch of work on this and looked within cohorts, you know, following cohort. There's a lot of wealth inequality. There's no way the basic model can predict it even within cohorts. So I agree, but at the same time, let me also say that we, we could take a, a long discussion about this at some point, but I'm not so fond of the life cycle models that don't take seriously the fact that people care about the kids and care about the utility of their kids. I, I don't think this is a good starting point, but I know that there are disagreements here, so let me not open the can of worms, but that is my position, which many of these papers do. For, for example, if you use the bequest function that has less curvature than your U of C today, you generate a lot of wealth inequality because of that, and people do that in this literature. I, it's like a little bit like, I don't think it's a good, it's a good thing. I mean, it's, to me, it's a trick, and, and, uh, but anyway, so, so let, me, let me move on. So here's, on average, we were shocked that we didn't need beta heterogeneity anymore, because uh, everything in the model now is just taken from various micro data sources. Um, so then, what, what about over time? So what we did was we fed in, I, I told you, we fed in swings in, in returns and stuff. So here's the housing return, we, we, which is a bit smoothed. This is the stock market uh, with excess return, how it moved over this period. And this is private equity, how it moved. And, and because we have the wealth shares, we're assuming the shares are constant over this time. We just, we just base them on the, on the Bach Calvea Soldini paper, which obviously is like uh, imperfect, but we do that. So we, 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 we then get a net total return uh, that varies over time. And then this is what we predict for inequality uh, over time. And th there are two gray uh, curves in each one. That's whether you use one or the other measure of the, of, of um, of, of wealth, but but basically our point here is that the model is the blue and it does surprisingly well to also track uh, inequality, wealth inequality over time. But, and let me just tell you here that the reason why it is U-shaped, the reason why we can track the U-shape uh, is that uh, the returns move that way. Without the return movements, you can't get this, all right? The other thing, it is moving up over time. What is behind that? That's the tax cut uh, started by Reagan and continued thereafter. The tax cut is a brutal force for higher inequality. And it's like underlying an upward trend, but the swings are all about asset prices. Per, can I can yes. I pause you on this and uh, to go back? So th these graphs are U.S. wealth inequality, right? But the yeah. but the the portfolio shares before were from Campbell Calvet Sardini. That's from Sweden, right? So well, it wasn't Campbell. It wasn't Campbell, but it but was whatever not, Calvet. Not, I'm sorry, yeah, Calvet Sardini and 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 maybe maybe Francisco. I'm not I'm not sure from which paper this is, but. Um, but this is from Sweden, right? So, and what's start, striking, I think, about your previous slide is this huge increase in the private equity, um, uh, right? Well, risk, the private risk. equity, sorry, 
the private equity, all of these returns are U.S. returns. I see. This is U.S. So these are not. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, but all, all U.S. It's only the portfolio shares and the basic, um, you know, the basic, uh, the, the, because of that, uh, and, and the idiosyncratic component size by asset group that you need individual data for. Otherwise, you, you can't uh, calibrate that. But that we go with, but then the aggregate returns, which, you know, again, they're here. I mean, they, we feed in the US path for, for each asset. Right. And, and so, the, so, I mean, the, of course, apologies for not using individual data on um, assets, but we, we like the Swedish one because it's like the whole population and stuff like that. But, but are these constant over time, these, these Swedish portfolio shares, or are you also using the time series evolution of those? No, we don't use it. We, the, the Swedish data is only covering like seven years. So we don't have any uh, movements in the shares. So this is like an imperfect in that sense. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that maybe Hanno uh, raised his hand also. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and a quick clarifying question about the nature of the exercise. So you're, are, are you changing the conditional distribution of returns as perceived by investors over time? Or are they, do they just believe that the conditional distribution of returns yeah, is yeah, constant over time? Thank you. Uh, we, we did two things. I mentioned it briefly. We did two things. One is that we, we let them have perfect foresight on the the way the expected returns evolve. The other one we did was they assumed that the, that the expected return today will prevail forever. So remember, they are not making portfolio choices. So all they can do about this information is to change the saving rate. And it turns out that the saving rate right. response is very minor. That's of course okay, an that's... excellent question. And I can see that you, you will be puzzling, but actually because we're hardwiring, of course, if you knew the stock market would boom, you would change your portfolio and stuff like that. Um, that, that we, we don't allow it, okay? So this is just to kind of get at the stuff we wanna get at. Let me now quickly, so I, I wanna move on a little bit. Uh, MPC distributions, so here, I want to do exactly what I told you in that rep agent silly, simple model. Let K0 go up by $100. Give people a one-time transfer. It's a pure, I mean, surprise, but it's also, it's not like somebody becoming employed because somebody becoming employed means that you get like more money, not only today, but also in the future. And this is why it's a little bit difficult to identify this in the data. Um, but of course, like some of the, good work uses, uh, I don't know, Trump uh, cash transfers and stuff to, uh, to get it. But all right, that's what we do. And people's response will depend on how much money they have, asset holding and the permanent income uh, component, if you're doing well in your labor earnings or not. Um, uh, and, and the consumption choice is, is uh, I, I don't know, I don't need to talk about this. So here you see average MPCs in our model and how they evolve over time. So average MPCs, remember they were very close to zero in the, in the, in the basic Iagori model. I mean, in the data, if those measures are correct, it's like 0.4. So we're not at 0.4 in 2030 because we, we predict what's gonna happen going forward. Um, they're up at 0.2, which is not 0.4, but you know, still, much, much higher than the standard model. Moreover, the shape follows the shape of the wealth distribution, the shape of either the Gini or these shares, okay? Uh, ignore the stuff bottom right, it doesn't play a big role here. But so the, we get the, the average MPCs to go up a lot. And here's a picture of the heterogeneity in MPCs. Uh, so this is just a percentile and you see that uh, there are some people to the extreme right that have very high MPCs in 1980, not that many, because there wasn't a lot of wealth inequality. But as wealth inequality has grown, uh, these curves are moving up. Uh, and you could see 2020, where we are now, that is a good chunk of people with MPCs at 0.4 or around 0.4, some above, some below. Then, of course, there's a large chunk of people, the richer people with emphases that are much lower. But anyway, th th that's, that's what this model 
delivers and it is i think it's much more reasonable and and, and it it will have very different responses to kind of uh, fiscal policy and all kinds of uh, macroeconomic policy i think all right uh, so just taking stock of what i've done now i think this model because this is a I mean, stepping stone for me uh, to move forward. So I think it captures salient features of the evolution of US wealth distribution. It's very promising. It doesn't get the, what's going on in the very, very top. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to make that qualification. But anyway, because they, they get even more rich than what the model predicts uh, in the data. Um, so, and we match all this stuff. I think the MPC distribution is maybe has some ways to go, but not very far. And, and all of this really required the finance part. If I shut down the heterogeneity in returns, and I mean, that in that paper, we made that very clear, that you don't get it. Um, so what I want to do for the remainder of the talk is to try to undo at least some of this hard wiring. Why is it? And I'm, I'm not going to try to address why people don't diversify, because that's too hard for me at this point. Uh, and I'd like to hear <laughs> your suggestions, but we're going to see, okay, why do the rich choose higher risk or share? I mean, they do in the data and why is it? And so here is my version of portfolio theory. And this will be like the permanent income model. So simple, it's not even like serious, but I think this is at the core of why we have problems. So first of all, macro kind of demands power utility. Why? Because otherwise, all kinds of long run facts, uh, the models cannot explain. So we, it's very difficult for us to do anything serious over time, unless we have power utility. That's required for kind of balanced growth features. So then think of a model that is just a one shot model, static. Example, you save, uh, you save and A is the result of saving which involves a risky um, uh, return. So you come into the period with A, and then you have some wage. Uh, and let, let's make the wage deterministic and constant now. But A, you can think of it as extent uh, uncertain because it's how much you save times the return. So uh, it's kind of like a one-shot thing, but as I told you before, in a dynamic model, the value function would look like this, except this is your total income. You would have to multiply it by one minus the saving rate because you don't consume all of your income. You save a big chunk, but the saving rate doesn't move a lot. So actually you would just multiply this by some number that doesn't play a big role. Um, okay, so this is not a bad approximation to what we see in the more calibrated dynamic infinite life models, okay? But so if you just use this value function, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, and you calculate the measure of relative risk aversion, which is, is, is important for understanding the risk of share, you see that it's sigma times A over A plus W. So this is clearly between zero and sigma. Uh, and if A is very large, it is sigma. But if A is low, it's much lower than sigma. So low values means you are less risk averse. And so very clearly, I mean, you can have a risk aversion of like zero here. Um, and, and so this is, this is why um, at the core of these models, you're gonna want the poor people to, the, the, the poor people will choose higher uh, stock uh, shares in their portfolios. It's very hard to avoid. Uh, okay, so um, if you add incomplete markets, you might think this is broken because the poor are more worried. They have this boring constraint they're worrying about. And, and so this is true. This is a mechanism that helps increasing V prime at low levels of A, okay? It's just that quantitatively, it's not very effective. As soon as you get, have a little bit of assets, uh, that effect is barely visible. Now, going back to that paper that got trashed a long time ago in 97, it was JDC, sorry, it wasn't, or, or actually I'm taking this from memory, so maybe it was microeconomic dynamics, who knows. Uh, anyway, we got it to go the right way. The rich people save more in stock there, but that's because 
we assume that the rate of return and the wage are perfectly correlated. Uh, in which case, you know, I mean, these are both random, they're moving in the same direction. So here, it doesn't matter. You get, you get uh, sigma for everybody if they move the same way. Uh, so, okay, so, uh, so anyway, and then on top of that, we had this uh, boring constraint and then we got it to go the right way. But uh, that was not a good calibration in hindsight. So now I just want to go over quickly a little bit um, household finance literature and, and, um, and do something which is what Calve and company, uh, Francisco included, did recently. I'm just going to follow up on this. And I think he had a question now. Is that correct, Nick? I, I saw it flashing yeah. by here. Maybe no, I mean, it was just a, just a quick point, kind of, I guess, again, on, and on Stavros, this point about OLG. I, if you have OLG, you also get constrained that you cannot have, that you need to have CRA for balanced growth also disappears. And if you have OLG, you can actually, you know, so that's also solves that problem. And then you could have, you know, DRRA uh, agents. Well, let's discuss that. I would disagree yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah, it was but, just a minor point, so that's why I lowered the hand as well. Yeah, so but I, I would actually disagree, but, but it's, it's okay. I, 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 I like the comment. Um, okay. okay. So, so here is like a stylized, this, this is just a stylized graph of what happens as a function of cash, and, uh, cash at hand in, in one of these models with persistent and transitory earnings shock. I mean, here doesn't cost anything to participate. Everybody buys risky to some extent, and uh, it's basically globally decreasing share. The lowest risky share is held by the, the rich, richest people. The poorest people have the highest risky share. Okay, so that, that's just like following the intuition I just gave you. Um, now, let me talk about this paper. And, and uh, I don't know what this Z is doing here. It should be an S, I, I believe, um, from 2005. Um, there's a lot of like richness of this framework. Um, and I have it listed here and I'm a little bit worried that I'll run out of time. So there's something here in, in kind of uh, describing there's education, wealth, uh, labor differences. The, 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 it's well known, especially among the, the authors <laughs> that, that all households uh, participate in the stock market unless they don't save it all, which you know, is a little bit of a strange special case. Um, and that the risky shares counterfactually high for low wealth health. Uh, households. So, and the wealth distribution isn't doing very well. But so here, I'm going to show you now is that we resold their model. Uh, so it's not exactly what's in the original paper. We just want, wanted to emphasize certain features. Um, so this is the same. I mean, this is the same type of graph as you saw here. The participation rate as a function of some measure of your wealth uh, and conditional on participating the risky share. Um, and the blue is the data. Um, SCF that we had here, and uh, uh, and uh, black is is the models, and you see, I mean most, I mean most of the focus should be on the risky share because there's no participation cost here, so it's like really falling. And in the data here, it is not increasing hugely, but it's increasing. Uh, inconsistency with the Swedish data. Uh, here's some measure of wealth. Um, Inequality, these are wealth deciles. Uh, the data is the blue. So the poor parts of the population simply don't have much data, uh, don't have much money in the data, but in the model, they have a lot here. So I think that's, that's a problem that this, I mean, this is like the basic Iagori model in that sense, it struggles with this. This is QQQ plus, which is, if you match the data, you should be on the 45. So this is like uh, each dot is a wealth percentile and you can see most of them are down here and the blue is again, the model, uh, the black is the data. And you see that basically the poor in the model save a lot more. They don't wanna be close to zero. So they save away from it, but yet in the data, uh, a lot of people are very poor. Okay, and, and at, at the top, it's the other way around. Okay, so we felt like, okay, this. Uh, so how do we improve on this? We, we, uh, so one, we, we, we started doing this actually years ago and then it turned out that Calvin and company and Francisco uh, are doing something similar. So, uh, so this is 
like parallel. So it's it, it to me it's a little bit a move of desperation. Is it possible that if you assume an economy where people have different sigmas, they have different betas, they have different many things, and I really don't think that we should believe in this macro model where everybody has the same exact parameters for everything. It's a it's a useful discipline maybe, but um, yeah, and, and which is why I thought as a random discount factor wasn't so bad um, when Tony and I first entertained it. But the problem, of course, is there's no direct measurement. But so it is a bit, but like then, it's in, in an act of desperation that we want to see, okay, can we make the model do a lot better? And so what we did was we started from their most recent stuff and just try something out, which is basing our numbers we have we have RRA and the discount factor jointly log normally distrib distributed. Um, uh, and I don't know, this is, this is a way we had of mapping their results or their estimated results to ours. So it's not a bad way to start because it's something they ended up with uh, after you know, looking in various categories. They, they have a lot of um, heterogeneity beyond this. Uh, the elasticity of intertemporal substitution because we have we have uh, Epstein's in here. Uh, we didn't assume a log normal. We just assumed two values um, with equal mass on each on each one. And then we we solved this model to just to see what what it would give. And this is the same type of graph as you saw before. We get the participation rate to uh, do pretty much nothing because we don't have costs of participating here. Um, the red is what we get from the model with preference heterogeneity. So it looks, I don't know, maybe a little bit more like the blue, uh, which is the data, but not much. The, the black is the, is the 2005 paper. So I don't know. So this is just one run we did yesterday. Um, we uh, intend to, I don't know, search the parameter space and see if there's something that can do better. Um, here is, I don't know, the wealth deciles, how do they look? Uh, so this CCGS is, is, is our rendition of what they have in their recent paper. Um, but, but it was just a short that was, uh, it should be within quotation marks. So you see that the, the, the red curve is closer to the blue curve for the poor. It's worse for the rich, but the, I think this is a, an improvement and you see it here too in the QQ plots. We added participation costs to this because we wanted the participation margin as well to be more interesting. Of course, we get participation to look better, but it's not like a very good match. Um, we also look at graphs over the life cycle because we do have a life cycle model here. Um, it looks a lot better than the baseline 2005 paper, um, uh, but other changes no huge ones, okay? So the, the summary of all of this is that uh, we, we're trying right now the path of preference heterogeneity in some sort of frustration of not having an off-the-shelf model that predicts the right things. And this is just to get the risky share to go up with wealth. Uh, this, I mean, this is still not at all touching the question of why there's no um, lack of diversification. So let me just conclude there by saying that portfolio choice to me has surfaced recently as not only relevant, but central to a number of macro questions. Uh, and I think there's like a marriage needed. Uh, and that's also why it was between macro and finance or household finance in particular. And that's also why I was excited to, to give this talk because I, I, I want to tell you all that I, I think it's super relevant to work in this area. Um, uh, but there, I mean, in part because there are big challenges, it's important and it's not like we have come a long way in my view. So why do the rich like risk more? I think it's a very tough question. Preference heterogeneity may help, but it's not obvious that it helps much. Why don't people diversify more? <laughs> it's very tough. Um, but I think this, the gold standard is 
restrict your stuff with micro observations that and then when at the end of the day you can match these portfolio facts and then i think we're off to the races but now this is very much to be considered uh, to be continued um I think there's a lot of like very relevant work ahead, as far as I can tell. Uh, but I also realize that I'm not like daily in this area. So for me, it's super helpful if you can, uh, I don't know, provide hints as to what we are doing wrong or something. I'm done. Alex, you have a question. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Thank Hi thanks, Per. That was very interesting. I, 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 I was, a, I'm a bit, um, well, I don't understand the intuition when you showed those very high marginal propensities to consume for the rich people. Can you say how that is coming in the, when you were doing it earlier? I mean, how, how? No, how... I didn't. No, I didn't. No, no, no. They, they are for, no, no. You mean the, this? Yes. How come they have No, no, this is the percentile. This is just saying how many people have MPCs that I are see. like 0.1 okay. or less. Okay, okay. So they're not necessarily those. Okay. No, no, it's the opposite. Okay. It's the opposite. Okay. It's support, and it's okay. very much driven by cash at hand. Sounds cash, good. cash on hand. They have okay. cash on hand. Poor people have very high M MPCs. Okay. Yeah. Vincenzo. Uh, yes. So I would like to um, uh, point out that. Um, um, uh, the way um, we bring the, the, these models to the data is very, is very informative, which uh, ultimately is just uh, a cross-sectional um, analysis. So you look at, for instance, a portfolio for, uh, compositions of uh, um, uh, low wealth individual and uh, um, very, very rich. But what uh, um, I think is a little bit missing, which is difficult to do, is uh, but how people become rich. So in other words, uh, it's a little bit of looking at uh, mobility. So in the data, for instance, uh, how many people that uh, uh, today are in the lower uh, wealth class uh, might, uh, might move in five or 10 years in, uh, let's say, high, um, high class. And uh, um, I think that once we start to look at these models in this way, I think that we, we can probably identify a lot of uh, um, anomalies. And, uh, but I think it's the right way to, to think because I, I, uh, one, once you start uh, thinking this way, I think that you also challenge us a little bit the way, at least you presented the, uh, the model, which is, uh, um, in order to change my portfolio composition, I need to become, um, become uh, rich. But I think that uh, the way pe some of the people really become rich is because when they are poor, they change their portfolio composition, they take a chance, uh, which is uh, not really in, uh, um, in the framework you de uh, developed um, uh, initially. At least this is the way I understood. Yeah, can I? Can I... Yeah, please, please, there, go ahead. I mean, I, I, I agree completely that this is important. And, and, um, uh, and also let me say that I, I think that you saw the Swedish data, the private equity uh, also refers to these important categories like entrepreneurs. <laughs> this is like the, the, the first paper, serious paper on this was your paper. And I, it's super important. Uh, and, and there, I think, I mean, that's a hint, but I, I agree we should look at this. I think there's been a bit of a frustration uh, for lack of data. Um, so I think micro data on time series of how people both have labor earnings and occupational choice and the portfolio choices they make is central to this story. And we're in part acting in frustration over not really having a complete picture there, but um, here the, uh, yeah, and, but my point is a little bit, we also want the portfolio choice to be made explicitly. And I'm struggling with that here because the kind of, you said, they take a chance, they do something. Um, mm -hmm. it's a portfolio choice. It's an active portfolio mm -hmm. choice. It could be an occupational choice. I mean, this is a very dead model in the sense. It's just an abstract. You're just choosing an asset. It doesn't involve your human mm. capital. So I know it's kind of a dead model and I, it, that frustrates me, but I think it also captures the core of many households. 
I don't think, I mean, so anyway, I, I um, um, of course, the, 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 that's a, a bit of a different way to get at this, but it's still going to be like restricted to do well in the cross section, but I, yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Pear. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Well, and, and especially because I didn't, I didn't know this was going to be your topic, but especially because, you know, some people know I have a work that addresses exactly these two questions in your last slide. Why do the rich people save more and why, you know, why people don't diversify? And you might call this a trick, but in, in my kind of off the shelf model, the, the people care about their relative relative status or relative position. So you can maintain balanced growth in the aggregate because people people's risk conversion decreases with their relative wealth rather than absolute wealth. Again, you might call this a trick, but it gets at these facts like increasing risky shares, non-diversification, or even in mobility facts that, uh, that uh, Vincenzo talked about and the role of entrepreneurs. Uh, but, you know, again. It, you know, it, Nick, let me just tell you, I, we, have a, we have a project that we had to halt because of COVID, but the project is to, I mean, living in a, in a small country, we can pretty much list the richest people. So we're gonna have, we, we're gonna actually survey the very richest and ask them kind of open-ended questions about their uh, por portfolio and saving behavior. And uh, my bet is that the, your story is not a good one, but you know, maybe it will come out to be correct. My, my bet is that these people are a lot kind of smarter than that. They're not just playing Monopoly, but you know, it's, I agree it's possible. So, but I think there's no way to decide without getting data from these people, so. I don't know if they will admit that what they're, what they're after no, is no, one of them. No, I, I see that, I see that. And, and whether you will admit that you're wrong at the end well, of the day. <laughs> I'm happy to admit that I'm wrong if data says that I'm wrong. <laughs> that was a joke, okay. Well, thank you so much, Pierre. This was great, thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Winston, you're you're back in control, but we barely have time for a break. So perhaps we should take Sorry. a minute break uh, yeah. before before Joel starts. Sorry for uh, maybe Joel can set up slides. Well, sure. Let me share here. <laughs>